Hello. My name is John Keating. I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Science here at the University. And it's my pleasure to welcome everyone to this event to mark the launch of the Centre for Science and Philosophy. We're very fortunate indeed at Bristol to have a very distinguished group working in the philosophy and history of science. Um, and this centre's been designed to underpin their work, both within their core activity and also the collaborations that they have generated that span every area of the, of the university. I know my friends in philosophy are extremely excited by the creation of this centre, uh, but I can attest to the fact that we in science are as well. It's my own view that it's very hard, if not impossible, to do science without thinking about the foundations of what you're doing, and I know many examples where discoveries in science, some of the great discoveries, have come about by an interplay of experiment uh, and foundational philosophical thinking. Uh, so we think this is very important too, and I'm here to tell you that I give this my very strongest blessing, the creation of this, uh, creation of this activity. Um, perhaps to a, give an example of how important we think it is, um, we now have a course which sits in our first year in the science faculty, uh, which is available to all students in the science faculty, where students, in almost the first lecture, um, encounter some of the ideas in the philosophy of science. Uh, and this opportunity to engage with philosophy of science goes right the way through uh, the curriculum. We have many joint degrees that run between science departments and the philosophy department, um, and goes all the way through to research that takes place uh, within the university and collaborations that take place uh, outside the university. So we're very, very, very enthusiastic about this, and it's my great pleasure now to hand over to Professor James Ladyman, uh, who'll tell you a little more about the evening and introduce our main speakers. So thank you, James. Thank you all very much for coming. It's great to see so many people here. Um, sometimes philosophy gets a bad press from scientists in the mainstream media and sort of middle-brow popular culture. So I think of Stephen Hawking suggesting that now physics has answered all the questions about the nature of reality. Philosophy isn't necessary anymore. And also Steven Weinberg famously said that philosophy of science was as much used to scientists as ornithology is to birds. And the purpose of uh, this evening is in part to persuade you, hopefully, that that view isn't correct. And so um, I'll say a few words about why we think the word philosophy needs to be in the, in the title there, the Center for Science and Philosophy. And science can't do every, it, it all on its own. That's really the thought. That Obviously, science throws up many questions that are ethical, political, and social. And there, philosophers bring their expertise in those areas to bear. But even if when we consider uh, matters internal to scientific theorizing, there are uh, questions about judgment and about inference which don't find an answer within scientific theories themselves. So let me give you an example. Um, when the Higgs boson was announced as discovered, that was because it was deemed to have passed a, a test, um, the Six Sigma test, which meant that the probability that the detection event was an error was something like 100 minus 95.9999. So the question is really, if that's, uh, if that's right, then how come in the um, medical sciences, two sigma significance is often considered perfectly uh, enough to make inferences? And if we were, we were looking for uh, more certainty, why didn't we wait until the Higgs boson was detected with 10 sigma significance or 100 sigma significance? And the point I'm really trying to make here is that science always involves uh, treading uh, a line between uh, credulity and skepticism. Individual scientists gather data, and that data often suggests an inference, a hypothesis, a generalization. But it's always possible to wait for more data before you make that inference or generalization. And uh, is an inelimitable role for judgment in the, in the decision making about when exactly you, you do that. In the case of climate science, for example, uh, a subject about which we've had some conferences on, on modeling and the epistemology thereof, it seems that we can't really afford to wait until we have something like Six Sigma significance 
uh, for our climate models. So judgment making in science, especially in areas like climate science, but also in medical science, interacts with broader questions of value and ultimately the weighing of uh, the, the need to avoid uh, false positives and the need to avoid false negatives. That is, we want to believe what's true, but if we rush ahead, we may end up believing what's false. And how exactly we should decide to balance up avoiding falsity with making sure we believe the truth is, I think, ultimately a philosophical matter. Now, as, as John said, I, I, I would endorse what John said, that also I think within science, there are many philosophical foundational issues. And one, uh, I, like, I like to give evidence of this by simply sci citing scientists who are both eminent and on opposite sides of the divide. So, for example, Steven Weinberg, quantum field theory is about particles. Robert Wald, quantum the field theory is not about particles. Uh, Dawkins, natural selection is all about genic selection. Group selectionists, no, it's not. It can act on groups. It can act on, on organisms. It can act on larger entities than just genes. So these debates are very much alive within every science, and I think one of the important roles that philosophy can play is by focusing our attention on such conceptual matters, which may not be important for much of the day-to-day -day business of getting on with science, but are important for the ultimate path that it takes. Now, we intend the center to subsume the kind of academic philosophy of science that you're going to hear about tonight but also to embrace much of what goes on in the university anyway under the auspices of the Institute for Advanced Study and the, the science faculty, the medical science faculties in the areas of science policy, ethics and medicine and science and society and so on. So it's the Center for Science and Philosophy broadly construed. Well, let me turn now to our, our speakers. I'm delighted to be able to uh, showcase our subject with such a distinguished uh, and exciting set of panelists. Uh, first of all, we'll hear from John Dupre. John Dupre uh, has, is currently the president of the British Society for the Philosophy of Science. He's professor of philosophy of science at the University of Exeter, director, director of the Economic and Social Research Council Center for Genomics in Society, has a recent book called Processes of Life, and he's a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. After John, we'll hear from Eleanor Knox. Eleanor did her undergraduate and graduate study at the University of Oxford in physics and philosophy and then the foundations and philosophy of physics. She's held a postdoc in the University of London and is now on a second postdoc at Leverhulme Early Career Fellowship when she will then take up a lectureship at King's College London in philosophy. Uh, then we'll hear from David Papineau. Uh, David is also at King's College London. He's Professor of Philosophy of Natural Science there. He's a former editor of the British Journal for the Philosophy of Science, a former president of the British Society for the Philosophy of Science, and his latest book is called Philosophical Devices. And finally, we'll hear from some homegrown talent. Uh, Richard Pettigrew studied mathematics and philosophy at the University of Oxford before coming to Bristol. He exemplifies the, the ethos of our approach to philosophy of science insofar as he took his PhD in the mathematics department with the intention of subsequently becoming a philosopher of mathematics, wanting to make sure he had the a, a proper technical knowledge to engage in that. He has recently been promoted to a readership and he's just starting a European Research Council starting researcher grant on epistemic utility theory. I very much hope you'll enjoy the four talks we have for you this evening and thank you again very much for coming and now over to John Dupre.